Lewis and Reinhold, page 286 to 301, Pompey the Great. But it concerns the glory of the Roman Empire and not that of one man to mention in this place all the records of the victories of Pompey the Great and all his triumphs which equal the brilliance of the exploits not only of Alexander the Great but even all, most of Hercules and a father Liber. After the recovery of Sicily, which inaugurated his emergence as a champion of the Commonwealth in the party of Sulla, and after the conquest of the whole of Africa and its reduction under our sway and acquirement as a trophy therefrom of the title of the Great, he rode back in a triumphal chariot, though only of equestrian rank, a thing which had never occurred before. Immediately afterwards, he crossed over to the west, and after erecting trophies in the Pyrenees, he added to the record of his victorious career the reduction under our sway of 876 towns from the Alps to the frontiers of Father Spain and with greater magnanimity, refrained from mentioning Sertorius, and after crushing that civil war which threatened to stir up our foreign relations a second time led into Rome a procession of triumphal chariots as an equus having twice been commander-in-chief before ever having served in the ranks subsequently he was dispatched to the whole of the seas and then to the Far East, and he brought back titles without limit from his country after the manner of those who conquer in the sacred contests, for these are not crowned with wreaths themselves, but crowned their native land. Consequently, he bestowed these honors on the city in the shrine of Minerva that he was dedicating out of the proceeds of the spoils of war. Gainus Pompeius Magnus, commander-in-chief, having completed a 30 years war, routed, scattered, slain, or received the surrender of 12,183,000 people sunk or taken, 846 ships received the capitulation of 1,538 towns and forts subdued the lands from the Maotians to the Red Sea, duly dedicates his offering Valda to Minerva. This is a, his summary of his exploits in the East, but the announcement of the triumphal procession that he led on September 28 in the consulship of Marcus Piso and Marcus Messala was as follows after having rescued the seacoast from pirates and restored to the roman people the, co the command of the sea he celebrated a triumph over asia pontius armenia paplogonia cappadocia cilicia syria the scythians jews and albanians iberia the island of crete the Bastinians, and in addition to these, over King Mithridates and Tigranes. The crowning pinnacle of this glorious record was, as he himself declared in assembly when discoursing on his achievements, to have found Asia the remotest of the provinces, and then to have made her a central dominion of his country. And if anybody on the other side desires to review, in similar manner, the achievements of Caesar, who showed himself greater than Pompey, he must assuredly roll off the entire world, and this, it will be agreed, is a task without limit. Having ended the wars, he celebrated five triumphs, four in one month, at intervals of a few days after vanquishing Scipio and uh, Another, after defeating Pompey's son, the first and most splendid was the Gallic triumph, 
the next the Alexandrian, then the Pontic, after the Africans, and finally the Spanish, each differing from the rest in its equipment and display of spoils as he rode through the Valabrum on the day of his Gallic triumph, the axle of his chariot broke and he was all but thrown out and he mounted the capital by torchlight with 40 elephants bearing lamps on his right and left. In his Pontic triumph, he displayed among the showpieces of the procession an inscription of but three words, I came, I saw, I conquered, not indicating the events of the war as others did but the speed with which it was finished to each and every foot soldier of his veteran legions he gave twenty four thousand sesterces by way of booty over and above the two thousand apiece which he had paid them at the beginning of the civil strife he also assigned them lands, but not side by side, to avoid dispossessing any of the former owners to every man of the people besides ten modi of grain and the same number of pounds of oil. He distributed the three hundred citerces, which he had promised at first, and one hundred apiece to Booth because of the delay. He also remitted a year's rent to tenants who paid 2,000 sesterces or less in Rome, 500 or less in Italy. He added a banquet and a dole of meat and after his Spanish victory two dinners for deeming that the former of these had not been served with a liberality credible to his generosity. He gave another five days later on a most lavish scale, then turning his attention to the reorganization of the state. He formed the calendar with which the pontiffs had long since so disordered by neglecting to order the necessary the intercalations that the harvest festivals did not come in summer nor those of the vintage in the autumn he adjusted the year to the sun's course by making it consist of 365 days abolition in the intercalary month and adding one day every fourth year furthermore that the correct reckoning of time might begin with the next calends of january he inserted two additional months between November and December, hence the year in which these arrangements were made was one of 15 months, including the intercalary month which belonged to that year according to the former custom. He filled the vacancies in the Senate and ruled additional partitions and increased the number of praetors Adelies and Equesters, as well as of minor officials. He reinstated those who had been degraded by official action of the censors or found guilty of electoral bribery by verdict of the jurors. He shared the elections with the people on this basis that except in the case of the consulship, half of the magistrates should be appointed by the people's choice while the rest should be those whom he personally had nominated and these he announced in brief notes like the following circulated among the tribes caesar the dictator to this or that tribe i commend to you so and so to hold their positions by your votes he admitted to office even sons of those who had been pres prescribed he limited the right of serving as juror to the two classes, the equestrian and senatorial orders, disqualifying the third group, the tribunes of the treasury. He made the enumeration of the people neither in the usual manner nor place, but from street to street, aided by the owners of blocks of houses. He then reduced the number of those who receive grain at public expense from 320,000 to 150,000 and to prevent the calling for additional meetings at any future time for purpose of enrollment. He provided that the places of such as died should uh, he filled by lot each year by the praetor from those 
who were not on the list. Moreover, to keep up the population of the city, depleted as it was by the assignment of 80,000 citizens to colonies across the sea, he enacted a law that no citizen older than 20 or younger than 40, unless detained by service in the army, should be absent from Italy for more than three successive years, that no senator's son should go abroad except as the companion of the magistrate or on his staff and that those who made a business of grazing should have among them herdsmen at least one-third who were men of a free birth. He conferred citizenship on all who practiced medicine at Rome and on all teachers of the liberal arts to make them more desirous of living in the city and to induce others to resort to it. As to debts, he disappointed those who looked for the cancellation, which was often agitated, but finally decreed that the debtors should satisfy their creditors according to a valuation of their possessions at the price which they had paid for them before the Civil War, deducting from the principal any interest that had been paid in cash or signed in writing an arrangement which wiped out about a fourth part of their indebtedness. He dissolved all associations except those of ancient foundation. He increased the penalties for crimes and inasmuch as the rich involved themselves in guilt with less hesitation because they merely suffered exile without any loss of property, punished murderers of free men by the confiscation of all their goods and murderers of all others by the loss of half. He administered justice with the ut most conscientiousness and strictness those convicted of extortion he even expelled from the senatorial order he annulled the marriage of an expert who had married a woman the very day after his divorce although there was no suspicion of adultery he imposed duties on foreign wares he denied the use of litters and the wearing of scarlet robes or pearls to all excerpts those of his designated position or age, and then only on fixed days in particular he enforced the law against extravagance, setting watchmen in various parts of the market to seize and bring to him dainties which were exposed for sale in violation of the law, and sometimes he sent the lictors and soldiers to take from a dining room and articles which had escaped the vigilance of his watchmen even after they had been served in particular for the beautification and convenience of the city as well as for guarding and extending the bounds of the empire he formed more projects and more extensive ones every day first of all to raise a temple to mars greater than any in existence filling up and leveling the pool in which he had exhibited the sea fight and to build a theater of vast size over by the Tarpian rocks, to reduce the civil law to fixed limits and to the vast and prolix mass of statues to include only the best and most essential in a limited number of volumes to open to the public the greatest possible libraries of Greek and Latin books assigning to Marcus Varro the charge of procuring and classifying them to drain the Pomptine marshes, to let out the water from Lake Fosinus, to make a highway from Adriatic across the summit of the Apennines to the Tiber, to cut a, a canal through the Isthmus of Corinth to check the Dacians who had poured into Pontus and Thrace, then to make war on the Parthians by way of lesser Armenia, but now to risk a battle with them until he had first tested their mettle. All these enterprises and plans were cut short by his death. Nevertheless, his countrymen, bowing to his good fortune and accepting the bit in the expectation that the government of a single person would give them some respite, from the civil wars and calamities appointed him dictator from for life this was indeed a tyranny avowed since his power was not only absolute but permanent as well his first honors which at least did not exceed the limits of ordinary human moderation were proposed to the senate by cicero but others vied with one another and carried them so excessively high 
that they rendered Caesar odious to the most moderate sort of men because of the pretensions and extravagance of the honors voted his enemies to no less than his flatterers are thought to have taken a hand in this so as to have as many pretexts as possible against him and appear to have the greatest ju justification for an attempt upon him. Fate, however, is to all appearances not so much unexpected as, a, as an avoidable for many amazing prodigies and apparitions, apparitions are said to have been observed shortly before the assassination. It is also related by many that a soothsayer warned him to be on his guard against a great danger on the day of the month of March, which the Romans called the Ides. When this day came, was come, Caesar, on his way to the Senate, greeted the soothsayer and said by way of raillery, Well, the Ides of March are come, and the soothsayer said to him quietly, I, they are come, but they are not gone. All these things might have happened by chance, but the place which was the scene of that murder and action, the place in which the Senate was then assembled, contained a statue of Pompey as it was one of the public adornments dedicated by Pompey in addition to his theater, showing quite clearly that it was the work of some heavenly power guided and calling the deed to that place. Indeed, it is also said that Cassius, just before the onslaught, looked across to Pompey's statue and silently implored his assistance, even though he was an ad adherent of the doctrines of Epicurus, but the crisis it would seem with the awful deed now close at hand replaced his former reasoning with inspired emotions as for Antony, who was faithful to Caesar and a strong man, Brutus Albinus, detained him outside, engaging him purposely in a lengthy conversation when Caesar entered the Senate rose up obsequiously <clears throat> and uh, some of Brutus confederates came and stood around behind his chair while others went to meet him as if to add their entreaties to Titulius Cyber's petition in behalf of his exiles, exiled brother and accompanied him to his chair and there joined entreaties after taking his seat he continued to repulse their beseechings, and as they pressed upon him with greater importunity, he began to be angry at one after another there upon Tilius laying hold of Caesar's toga with both hands pulled it down from his neck, and this was the signal for the assault. Caesar struck the first blow in his neck, not a mortal wound, nor even a deep one, since he was probably very nervous at the beginning of a great venture, Caesar turned about, seized the dagger, and held it fast. And almost at the same instant, both of them cried out, the smitten man in Latin, Valcasa, Valcasca, what does this mean? And the, the smiter in Greek to his brother, brother, help. Such was the beginning, and those who were privy to the plot were filled with consternation and horror at what was going on. They durst not fly nor go to Caesar's aid, nor so much as utter would, but those who had come prepared for the murder bared each of them his dagger and closed in on Caesar in a circle. Whichever way he turned, he encountered blows and weapons leveled at his face and eyes and driven hither and th thither. Like a wild beast, he was entangled in the hands of all, for it had been agreed that they should all strike him and taste of the slaughter, for which reason Brutus also gave him one stab in the groin. Some say that he fought and resisted all the rest, tossing this away, and that the crying aloud, and that, and crying aloud, but when he saw that Brutus had drawn his dagger, he pulled his toga down over his head and sank. Whether by chance or because pushed the deer by his murderers against the pedestal on which Pompey's statue stood, and the pedestal was drenched with his, with his blood, so that Pompey himself seemed to be pre presiding over the vengeance upon his enemy, 
who lay here at his feet quivering from multitude of wounds for they say he received 23 and many of the conspirators were wounded by one another as they directed so many blows against one body when caesar had been dispatched brutus came forward as if to say something about what had been done the senate would not hear him but burst out of doors and in its f flight filled the people with confusion and helpless fear so that some shut up their houses while others left their counters and shops and all were running about some to the place to see the sad spectacle others away from there when they had seen Antony and Lepidus, Caesar's most faithful friends, stole away and took refuge in some friends' houses. But Brutus and his followers, just as they were, still hot from the murder, displaying their naked daggers, marched into a body from the Senate house to the Capitol, not like fugitives, but full of joy and confidence, summoning the people to liberty and welcoming into their ranks the most distinguished of those they encountered some of these did join and go along with them acting as if they had shared in the deed and laying calm to the glory the next day brutus accompanied by the others came down from the capital and made a speech to the people who listened to what was said without either expressing resentment at what had been done or appearing to approve but they showed by their complete silence that they pitied caesar but respected brutus the senate attempted to effect a general amnesty and reconciliation it voted that caesar should be honored as a divinity and that not even the most insignificant measure which he had enacted during his dictatorship should be changed to Brutus and his followers, it distributed provinces and other suitable uh, offices. Thus, all thought matters were brought to the best possible settlement and compromise. At the request of his father-in-law, Lucius Piso, his will was opened and read in Antony's house. He had made it on the IDs of the preceding September at his villa near La Vicom and committed it to the care of the chief Vestal Virgin. Quintus Tubero states that from his first consulship until the beginning of the Civil War, it was his wont to write down Genius Pompey at his heir and to read this to the assembled soldiers in his last will however he named three heirs the grandsons of his sisters namely gaius Octav octavius to three-fourths of his estate and lucius pinarius and quintus pedius to share the remainder at the end of the will he also adopted gaius octavius into his family and gave him his name Several of his assassins were named among the guardians of his son in case one should be born to him, and Decimus Brutus, even among his alternate heirs, to the people he left his gardens near and near the Tiber for their common use and three hundred sesterces to each man. When the funeral was announced, a pyre was erected in the Campus Martius near the tomb of Julia. Before the platform was placed, a guided shrine made after the model of the Temple of Venus, Gynatrix. Within was a bear of ivory with coverlets of purple and gold, and at its head a pillar hung with the robe in which he was slain since it was clear that the day would not be long enough for those who offered gifts they were directed to bring them to the cap to the campus by whatsoever streets of the city they wished regardless of any order of precedence mm -hmm. instead of a eulogy the consult antony ca caused a herald to recite the decree of the senate in which it had voted caesar all divine and human honors at once and human honors at once and likewise the oath with which they had all pledged themselves to watch over his personal safety to which he 
added a few words of his own. The briar before the platform was carried to the forum by magistrates and ex-magistrates, while some were urging that it be burned in the temple of Jupiter Capitolonius and others in the Curia of Pompey on a sudden uh, two beginnings and swords by their sides and brandishing a pair of darts set fire to it with blazing torches and at once the throng of bystanders heaped upon it dry branches to judgment seats with the benches and whatever else could serve as an offering then the musicians and actors tore off their robes which they had taken from the equipment of the triumphs and put on for the occasion ran them to bits and threw them into the flames the veterans of the legions threw in the arms with which they had adorned themselves for the funeral many of the women too offered up the trinkets which they wore and the amulets and robes of their children at the height of the public grief a throng of foreigners went about lamenting each after the fashion of his country above all the jews who came flocked to the place for several successive nights the populace with torches in their hands ran from the funeral to the houses of brutus and cassius and after being repelled with difficulty they slew helvius Cinna when they met him through a mistake in the name supposing that he was cornelius Cena, who the day, day before had made a bitter indictment of caesar and for whom they were looking and they set his head upon a spear and paraded it about the streets afterwards they set up in the forum a solid column of numidian marble almost twenty feet high and inscribed upon it to the father of his country at the foot of this they continued for a long time to sacrifice make vow and settle some of their disputes by an oath in the nature of caesar in the first two selections that follow both written after the assassination of caesar cicero expresses without menacing words an estimate of the lead dictator that was undoubtedly shared by a large segment if not a large majority of the senatorial nobility of the third selection matthias replied to cicero's letter the eminent historian t rice holmes has written the roman republic uh, 111 uh, 349 the funeral oration of mark antony shakespeare had uh, transmuted into a possession for all time but gaius matthias left a tribute to the memory of caesar which all although it is at present known only to the few who were who are versed in latin literature may eventually be recognized as a greater worth Matthias had offended the assassins and their sympathies by helping to defray free the cost of the games which Caesar had instituted in connection with the foundation of the Temple of Venus and Cicero had made remarks about this and other matters which were repeated to Matthias and wounded him. Cicero compels an apology which did honor Matthias if not to himself and Matthias gladly accepting his explanation replied in a letter which seems to me the noblest that has come from antiquity. Caesar used to have constantly upon his lips the Greek verses from Phoenicae, which I will rep reproduce as well as I can, awkwardly it may be, but still so that the meaning can be understood if wrong may e'er be right for a throne's sake, were wrong most right be God in all else feared. Our tyrant deserved his death for having made an exception of the one thing that was the blackest crime of all. Why do we gather instances of petty crime, petty crime, legalities, criminally obtained and fraudulent buying and selling? Behold, here you have a man who was ambitious to be king of the Roman people and master of the whole world, and he achieved it. The man who maintains that such an ambition is morally right is a madman for he justifies the destruction of law and liberty and things there hideous and detestable suppression glorious 
But if anyone agrees that it is not morally right to be king in a state that once was free and that ought to be free now, and yet imagines that it is advantageous, advantageous for him who can reach that position with what re remonstrance or rather with what appeal should I try to tear him away from so strange a delusion for all oh, immortal immortal gods can the most horrible and hideous of all murders that of Fadolan bring advantage to anybody even though he who has committed such a crime receives from his enslaved fellow citizen title of father of his country Cicero to Gaius Matthias greeting it is it must be obvious to so clever a man as yourself that if Caesar was a king and it seemed to me that he was two opposite views may be taken of the morality of your attitude either the one I generally take myself that your loyalty and kindly feeling <clears throat> in showing your esteem for a friend even after his death is worthy of all praise or the other which some people take that our country's freedom should be preferred to a friend's life gaius martius to cicero greeting your letter gave me great pleasure because i learned that your opinion of me was what i had hoped and prayed for i know the charges made against me since Caesar's death. People blame me for lamenting the death of a dear friend and expressing my indignation that the man whom I loved has perished. They say that country should be preferred to friendship as though they had proved that his death had been good for the state. I will not enter any subtle plea. I confess that I have not attained the height of philosophy. I was not a partisan of caesar in the political controversy though i did not abandon a friend however which i disprove of what he was doing however much i disproved of what he was doing nor did i ever approve of the civil war or of the motive for the quarrel which in fact i did my utmost to get nipped in the bud so when my friend was victorious i was not caught by the charm of office or of money prizes which others though they had less influence with him than i clutched at with unstrained avidity indeed my own property was actually curtailed by caesar's law thanks to which most of those who are now exulting in his death maintain their position in the state that my vanquished countrymen should be spared was as much an object to me as my own safety can i then who desired that all should be left unharmed help being indignant that the man by whom that boom was bestowed had perished especially as the same man was responsible both for unpopularity and for his death you shall smart then they say for daring to condemn what we have done what unheard of in insolence one man may glory in crime yet another may not even lament it with impunity why even slaves have always been free to indulge their fears and joys and sorrows without any one one's dictation but from what your champions of liberty keep saying, they are trying to wrest this right from us by terrorism. But they will try in vain, no dread of danger shall ever turn me from gratitude or from humanity. For never have I thought that an honorable debt should be shrinked, shirked off that it should even be welcome but why this indignation against me if my only wish is that they should regret what they have done my desire is that all the world should feel the bitterness of caesar's death ah, but as a loyal citizen it is my duty to desire the safety of the constitution well unless my past life as well as my hopes for the future prove without a word of mind that such it is earnest wished such is my earnest wish 
I make no claim to demonstrate it by speechifying. Am I then the evening of my life to effect a radical change in the principles I maintained in the heyday of my youth, when even a serious error might have been excused and with my own hands unweave the texture of my life that I will not do, nor will I do anything to give offense except that I do gr grieve at the heart fate of one who was to me the dearest of friend and with all the most illustrious of men but even if i were otherwise minded i should never disavow my own actions and thereby get the reputation of being a rogue in with wrongdoing and a coward and hypocrite in concealing it ah but i undertook the management of the game celebrated by the young caesar in honor of the elder caesar's victory while that is a matter of private obligation and has nothing to do with the constitution of the republic anyhow it was a duty i was bound to perform as a tribute to the memory and eminence of one very dear to me even though he was dead and a favor i could not refuse when he claimed it to a youth of such brilliant promise and so entirely worthy of his means namesake I have also often visited the house of Antony to consult to pay him my respects, but you will find that those very men who consider me lacking in patriotism are constantly going to him in crowds with the intention of asking him for something or of carrying something away with them. Is this not the height of presumption that while Caesar never interfered to prevent my having friends of my own choice? even those whom he himself disliked, those who have robbed me of my friend should now captiously endeavor to prevent my bestowing my affection on whom i choose i have no fear however that the moderation of my life will hereafter prove an inadequate protection against slander or that even those who dislike me for my steadfast loyalty to Caesar will not prefer friends of my stamp rather than of their own. If my prayers are granted me, I shall pass what remains to me of life in retirement at Rhodes. If any accident intervenes to prevent it, I shall live at Rome, but only as one whose lifelong desire is to maintain the right, the transitory coalition of convenience between the Senate and young Octavian against Anthony of which Cicero was the chief architect lasted until the defeat of Antony at Mutina in April 43 BC after which the Senate erone erroneously expected that young Caesar could be praised honored and removed the epigram is Cicero's letters to friends books the following are two of a large number of similar resolutions proposed but mostly not passed in the Senate by Cicero during this period, particularly significant are the proposals in favor of veterans. Whereas Caius Caesar, son of Gaius Pontifex Pro Praetor, at a serious crisis of state, has exhorted the veteran soldiers to defend the liberty of the Roman people and has enrolled them. And whereas the Martian Marshan and fourth legions with the utmost zeal and the most admirable unanimity in serving the state under the instigation and leadership of Gaius Caesar are defending and have defended the state and the liberty of the Roman people and whereas Gaius Caesar proctor has has with an army set out for the relief of the province of Cisapine Gaul has brought under his own obedience and that of the Roman people, Calvary, archers, and elephants, and has at a most diffic difficult crisis of the state come to the assistance of the safety and dignity of the Roman people. Therefore, for the, these reasons, it is the pleasure of the Senate that Gaius Caesar, son of Gaius Pontifex, Proprietor shall be a senator and uh, shall express his opinion on the proprietorian benches and that for whatever office he seeks the same account shall be taken of his candidacy 
and can this is can they see as would be legally permissible if he had been a question last year it is the pleasure of the senate that the veteran soldiers who attaching themselves to the leadership of caesar pontifex proprietor have defended and are defending the liberty of the roman people and the authority of their this our order shall have they and their children exemption from military service that the consuls Gaius Pansa Pansa and Aulus Hurtius one or both <clears throat> if they see fit shall investigate what land there is in those colonies in which the veteran soldiers have been settled which is held in violation of the Julian law so that it may be divided among the veteran soldiers and that they shall make a separate investigation concerning the companion land the companion land and devise a plan for increasing the benefits of the veteran soldiers that the martian and fourth legions and those soldiers of the second and 35th legions who joined the consuls Gaius Penser and Aulus Ertius and enlisted because the authority of the Senate and the liberty of the Roman people is and has been most dear to them shall have for themselves and their children exemption from military service except in case of insurrection in Gaul or Italy that these legions at the end of the war shall be discharged that whatsoever sum of money Gaius Caesar Pontifex Propertia Proprietor has promised the soldiers of these legions per man such shall be given them that the consult Gaius Panzer and Aulus Hertius, one or both, if they see fit, shall keep an account of what land can without injury to private individuals be divided, and that to these soldiers of the Martian and Fourth Legion lands shall be granted and assigned in the fullest measure, even granted or assigned to soldiers, which each proceeded with 300 men to the bridges over the river Lepidi Lepidus by himself, went before them, searched the island, and waved his military cloak as a signal to them to come then each left his 300 men in charge of friends on the bridges and advanced to the middle of the island in plain sight as there the three sat together in council octavian in the center because he was consulted they were in conference from morning till night for two days and came to these decisions that octavian should resign the consulship and ventidius take it for the remainder of the year that a new magistracy for settling the civil dissensions should be created by law which Lepidius, Antony, and Octavian should hold for five years with consular power for this name seemed preferable to that of dictator, perhaps because of Antony's decree abolishing the dictatorship that these three should at once dignate the yearly magistrate of the city for the next five years that a distribution of the provinces should be made giving anthony the whole of gaul except the part bordering the pyrenees mountains which was called old gaul this together with spain was assigned to lepidus while octavian was to have africa sardinia sicily and the other islands in the vicinity thereof thus was the dominion of the romans divided by the triumvirate among themselves only the assignment of the parts beyond the adriatic was postponed since these were still under the control of brutus and cassius against whom anthony and octavian were to wage war Lepidus was to consult the following year and to remain in the city to do what was needful there. Meanwhile, governing Spain by proxy, he was to retain three of his legions to guard the city and to divide the other seven between Octavian and Antony, three to the former and four to the latter, so that each of them might lead twenty legions to war to encourage the army with expectation of booty they promised them besides other gifts eighteen cities of italy as colonies cities which excelled in wealth 
in the splendor of their estates and houses and which were to be divided among them land buildings and all just as though they had been captured from an enemy in war the most renowned among these were capua regium venusia benevitum nuceria ariminum and vivo thus were the most beautiful parts of italy marked out for the soldiers but they decided to destroy their personal enemies beforehand so that the latter should not interfere with their arrangements while they were carrying on war abroad octavian and antony having come to these decisions they reduced them to writing and octavian as consult communicated them to the soldiers all except the list of prescriptions when the soldiers heard them they applauded and embraced each other in token of mutual reconciliation as soon as the triumvirs were by themselves they joined in making a list of those who were to be put to death they put on the list those who they suspected because of their power and also their personal enemies and they exchanged their own relatives and friends with each other for death both them then and later for they made additions to the catalog from time to time in some cases on the ground of enmity in others for a grudge merely or because the victims were friends of their enemies or enemies of their friends or on account of their exceptional wealth of for the triviers needed a great deal of money to carry on the war since the revenue from asia had been paid to brutus and cassius who was still collecting it and the kings and uh, satraps were also contributing to them so the tri triumvirs were short of money because europe and especially italy was exhausted by wars and exactions from which reasons they levied very heavy contributions from the plebeians and finally even from women and contemplated taxes on sales and rents by now too some were prescribed because they had handsome villas or cities city residences the number of senators who were sentenced to death was about 300 and of equities about 2000 there were brothers and uncles of the triumvirs in uh, the list of the prescribed and also some of the officers serving under them who had had some difficulty with the leaders or with the fellow of officers the triumvirs entered the city separately in three successive days octavian antony and lepidus each with his praetorian cohort and one legion as they arrived the city was speedily filled with arms and military standards disposed in the most advantageous places a public assembly was forthwith convened in the midst of these armed men and a tribune Publius Titius proposed the law providing for a new magistracy for settling the present disorder to consist of three men, namely Lepidus, Antony, and Octavian, to hold office for five years with the same power as consuls. No time was given for scrutiny of this measure, nor was a day fixed for voting on it, but it was passed forthwith that same night. The prescription of 130 men was proclaimed in various parts of the city, and a little later, 150 more additions to the list were constantly made to these who were condemned later or previously killed by mistake, so that they might seem to have perished justly it was ordered that the heads of all the victims should be brought to the triumvirs for a fixed reward which to a free person was payable in money and to a slave in both money and freedom all persons were required to afford opportunity for searching their houses those who receive fugitives or conceal them or refuse to allow search to be made were liable to the same penalties as the prescribed and those who informed against such were allowed the same rewards above the prescription edict was in the following words marcus lepidus marcus atonius and octavius caesar chosen by the people to set in order and regulate the republic declare as follows had not 
perfidious traitors begged for mercy and when they had obtained it become the enemies of their benefactors and conspire against them neither would gaius caesar have been slain by those whom he saved his clemency after capturing them in war whom he admitted to his friendship and upon whom he heaved offices honors and gifts nor should we have been compelled to use this widespread severity against those who have insulted us and declared as public enemies now seeing that the malice of those who have conspired against us and by those hands gaius caesar perished cannot be mollified by kindness we prefer to anticipate our enemies rather than suffer at their hands let no one who sees what both caesar and ourselves have suffered consider our actions unjust cruel or immoderate although caesar was clothed with the supreme power although he was pontifex maximus although he had thrown and added to our sway sway the nations most formidable to the romans although he was the first man to attempt the untied untried the sea beyond the pillars of hercules and was the uh, discoverer of our country's hair too unknown to the romans this man was slain in the middle of the senate house which is de designated as a sacred under the eyes of the gods with 23 disastrously wounded by men whom he had taken prisoner in war and had spared while some of them he had named co-heirs of his wealth